the picture of you background. What's that? I see the picture of you fighting in the background. Yeah, my wife put all that stuff together. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Hey, how, how, what, what weight class did you fight Rumble Johnson at? 170. That's crazy, man. So I, we fought at 170, and then after that fight, he went up to 185, missed weight that next fight at 185 by 11 pounds. How did then he make my, weight for you? I don't know, man. That's just what he did. He, he, back then, you could use IV bags, you know, to rehydrate. So yeah. he and, you know, uh, everyone would just cut a bunch of weight and then. What do you think he weighed when you actually got in the ring with him? You know, I, I forget who or where I heard this, but 205 is the number that sticks in my mind. Um, yeah, and I probably weighed 178. Wow. Yeah. And then he fought all the way up at heavyweight. So this is oh, no. He got this real is, heavy, man, when he, when he, when he retired, especially when he retired. It looked like he was bodybuilding almost. Yeah, he yeah. was, yeah. And then we, we were together. I tell the story often when I talk about him, but we were together in Philadelphia um, five weeks before that fight. And there's a picture online. Um, we're standing side by side, and and I'm literally under his wing. And the uh, the UFC one of the the PR girls wanted to take that picture, and I feel like for that reason, and I didn't want to do it. And then finally, I basically got like kind of cornered into this situation where he's a super nice guy, but still, I didn't want to give him that visual to you know that image of being oh, so this much before you're gonna fight him five weeks before he was up 220 oh pounds God. yeah right it's like look at this little look at this little guy fighting you know yeah i, yeah. I was not was he, the, was he the hardest hitter you've ever been in the ring with yeah i say that too he's the only one that i've ever felt like felt it you know where i've yeah. said ouch in my head when he hit me i remember i was underneath i shot kind of like uh i mean in retrospect a, a not a good double leg and uh, i was underneath and he was like punching me coming up under right. um and man, it was just smacking my jaw, and it yeah, it hurt very it was bad. Kidding. Yeah. So and it's it's a punch with not a lot of leverage too, just kind of exactly. like an arm punch. Exactly. You know? And then the one yeah. that yeah, that's exactly right. And then the one that put me on my butt was a, a shin to my face. I didn't feel that. I saw it coming, but it's like my brain was still working, but my my muscles and brain weren't connected. So I knew that his kick. I saw it. I was up against the side of the cage, kind of like. Like I said, my mind was in it, but I couldn't move my body. I was leaning against the cage, standing up, and I saw him like set for a switch kick, and I thought, "Oh no, it's coming!" And then it smacked <laughs> me in the face, fell to my butt. That kind of knocked me back into total whatever, and then the ref stopped it. So, yeah, wow, yeah. that's amazing, man. Super powerful guy. All right, buddy, I'm ready to go. All right, so I, I may actually include that little segment there. That was okay, sure. Fun to talk about, but yeah, so I'm here with Mark Marrow, and I'll talk about it on the introduction. But I, I haven't checked the numbers, Mark. But I mean, I can't imagine it was surpassed. But you're my my most popular, uh, most downloaded episode that I've ever done, and that's largely in part to you sharing it with your audience. So you know, thank you for that. That's episode number one fifty two. If anyone wants to go back and listen to it, but the reason I reached out to you, Mark, and and the reason I want to put this out during this time is because the first thing I thought whenever schools were canceled was, oh my gosh, there's so many kids at home without connection, without guidance, without hope, without encouragement, without that thing that some of them only get at school, right? And there's no routine, there's no consistency, and that can be an unhealthy place. And you know, as well as anyone, that world for students, because you interact with so many. So I just wanted to bring you on and kind of Maybe let's start there. You know, when, when you think of students being at home, I mean, what goes on in your mind? Well, you know, Charlie, um, there's a lot of issues that kids face, whether in school or out of school, but um, idle time is, is always not good, too. And sometimes when they have a lot more idle time, you find yourself playing more video games. You find yourself more on your, your cell phone doing things that are not really productive, but just the pastime watching TV and things like that. But you know, the, the other thing, Charlie, is that, that uh, parents have been put into a new role in life. All of a sudden, a parent becomes a teacher. And I think many parents are realizing this is, this is not what I want to do. I mean, it's really, it's difficult when you have to put your kid through different classes and being at home, whether it's math or social studies or, or whatever it is, that 
parents are now like, oh my gosh, I don't know, I don't know how I can do this. I mean, I'm watching, this, and I don't know, and I don't make me make light of, make light of this, but I have watched some really funny videos of parents that have posted things about them trying to teach their kids something because they're like, I don't even know myself, you know, and I'm trying to teach my kid this. And so it's a, it's a difficult situation, but you know, Charlie, we're, we're, we're all in this together and together we're going to get through this. Um, but speaking of kids that are, are depressed or have anxiety um, or, or self-harming or even, you know, suicidal thoughts, you know, and just like you, we, we get a lot of mail from students that reach out to us, you know, and a lot of times before you could say, you know, have you talked to your school counselor about something like this? And now they're, they're home and many of them don't want to tell or talk to their parents about it or their parents don't understand or whatever it is. And we become that light in their darkness. And I find myself taking on an awful lot of this. And sometimes, and, and Charlie, we're, we're both human, man. You, you can read 20 uh, messages in a row of kids that are depressed, suicidal, broken, lost, whatever. And you're just going, oh my gosh, I, there's only so much you can do. And if you, you have to, especially kids that, that are suicidal, you, you have to find an adult intervention there. And, um, and, and sometimes I'm, I'm the only one they have. And it's I talk to them about reaching out to whether it's a suicide hotline or talking to um, someone that can, can be there for them. Sometimes, you know, someone in person is much better than, than, than someone on, on the internet or something like that. So that's been a, uh, a challenging thing. And, you know, with school, it just started. I and mean, we're only a couple weeks in right now. What's going to be like a couple months in, six months in? You know, some schools are canceling for the rest of the year. And um, it's affected both of us. Our livelihood is, is live presentations at schools. So for me, it's, 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 been, it's been a real downer. And in fact that, I, Charlie, I never realized how much I need this. And, and when I say that, when I say need it, meaning that that stage was like my therapy. I mean, I talk about all my depression, anxiety, my my, my thoughts of suicide when I was younger, uh, everything that I've been through in my life, the tragedy of losing so many important people in my life, and as d difficult it is to talk about, but realizing that, man, I was helping a lot of people. And when you're not in that live presentation anymore, it, it makes you just sit home and you're going, oh my gosh, and you know, now I'm spending so much time answering mail or reaching out to students, who it becomes overwhelming at times. So I, I don't know. How do you feel about it, man? You, I, I'm assuming you're probably going through a lot of the same stuff. Yeah, I am. And it's interesting to hear, you know, the, the, everything you just said, but a couple of things that stick out to me. You mentioned you didn't realize how much you need it, right? And I, I, I've thought that about you because, you know, you're a mentor to me personally and professionally. You've, you've extended your hand. You've taught me so much about different aspects of, of the, you know, the job and the profession. And, and I know how much I get from my presentations and, and I probably do a 10th of the number of presentations you do. So when I, I watch you, you know, I follow you on social media and I watch you and I listen and I, I, you know, I talk to you also directly. I know how much I get from it and I know the void that I feel from it. It's like, it, it gives you such a, a fulfilling purpose. It, it gives like, when my, my best days are the days when I present and then after that, when you talk and you have the, these, these young boys and girls, young men and women who come to you and, and honest to goodness, man, they just, they just open up and divulge, they, they just share. And, and it's like, there's just this door that was opened between you and them and they see brings me to tears, man. They just, they see nothing but hope and light. You mentioned the light, right? That's all they see. And that's such a, a purposeful thing to experience that. Yeah. I mean, the, the other side of that is not being able to do that. And, and it's, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's tough and, and you do what you can. You know, Charlie, you mentioned the word purpose and, and I really believe like, um, you know, I was successful in, in, in many sports in my life, football, hockey, boxing, wrestling, uh, wrote a book, uh, inspirational speaking. But the, the purpose I really found in my life was, was these kids, these like making a difference in somebody else's life. There's, there's no greater joy. 
It has nothing to do with ego or having to be up on stage or having my picture taken. It has to do with really making a difference in someone's life. And me be do, doing this now 13 years, Charlie, I get letters from kids that saw me, you know, um, you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago when I first started that said that day you changed my life. Now I own my own business or professional sports or professional singer or whatever it is that they accomplished happened or was written into existence the day that mm -hmm. they saw me. Uh, during the presentation, and, and and that's what I miss, you know. And but during this off time, Charlie, the one thing I'm I'm going to do, and and you know, you you talk about me being your mentor and your, that, all that stuff, you know, and I, and I appreciate that. But I got to say something: iron sharpens iron. Okay, <laughs> you have no idea how much you've encouraged me. You know, one of the things that I don't even how, how to say this. I don't know anybody like you. The way that you could read a book. I mean, when I say that, I mean book after book after book. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just so like jealous of that in, in such a, a, a positive way, you know. Um, I'm actually, you know, reading your book, you know, and I love it, Charlie. Um, I'm halfway done. You see a little marker yeah. there, halfway done through your book, and I'm going to finish it in, in the next uh, week or so here. Um, but just reading this book is, is giving me so much insight into your life and to the person that I, I already knew you were, but it's like, the way you grew up and the way your parents were and, and the way you, you're, you're parenting you and your wife are parenting your children. You know, there's just so much good stuff in that book, man. And it's just a, a testament to the character of, of the kind of person that you are. So when you say that I'm your mentor and I've helped you in this, I appreciate that, man. But you also, Charlie, have helped me so much. And I'm, I'm so honored and blessed to call you a friend and a, a friend that, that I would reach out to if I was ever going through a hard time or a serious issue. Oh, I appreciate that. And it's, it's neat. You know, I I've met a lot of people, a lot of famous people and I interact with them and there's, there's few that I can text and they'll text me right away. Or there's few that I can call on a Tuesday at 8 PM and, and not feel, am I overstepping my boundaries here? Are, are we, are we like this type of friend or are we the type of friend where I send them an email and then set up a call, et cetera. So it's a hundred percent reciprocal and, and I appreciate every ounce of it as well. I have a question kind of, and I'll touch on the books and we'll get kind of more into to books. I'm sure a little bit. At yeah. Least. There's, there's some things I want to share about your yeah. book that were really cool. I think will help a lot of people that uh, when we talk about it, but go ahead. Yeah. So Mark's first interview on the show, um, it's episode number 152. And we talk a lot about his story, um, his upbringing, introduction to sports, loss, fame in the WWF how he kind of transitioned and moved on from there. And again, that's episode number 152. And I don't want to cover all that again. But one of the things I do want to ask, because I know what my reasoning is, like why I'm drawn to, to middle school and high school, why, why I feel compelled to put the majority of my energy in that direction. For me, it's because I remember that time in my life, realizing loneliness, understanding that people are different. Um, sometimes because of differences in, in myself, sometimes I, I feel very alone. And sometimes I, oftentimes I would cry to my parents. We have a very open relationship. You know, I'd cry on my parents' shoulder and say, why? I don't understand. And I came from a position where I got good grades and I was a really good athlete. And I came from a great family. So if I had those three things going in my favor, yet I felt so alone and isolated, I can only imagine how other young people feel who don't have one or any of those things. So I feel like, you know, the, the driver of my discipline in my work, I think is fear, you know, like not being prepared that, that that's to me the, the most scary thing in the world. If you're in a fight, you know, you don't want to be unprepared. You want to be prepared. If someone calls you to present on a stage tomorrow in front of a million people, I want to be ready. Right. So that drives my discipline. What drives my, mission to, 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 to positively influence and affect young people is that I don't want them to feel that way, right? Mm, because it's good. terrible. That's it's good. lonely. What about for you? Like, where does that come from? No, it's the same thing. You know, I, I, I've been broken, lost, hurt. When I was younger, I, I hated to be embarrassed. You know, I mean, I just, I know that feeling. And, and I remember, you know, going to school with, with my mom would buy her clothes at garage sales. We were so poor, you know, and I remember um, being in school, and then someone recognized that I bought my clothes at their garage sale or my parents mm -hmm. and my mom did, you know. And I remember just that feeling of feeling so, oh my gosh, just so embarrassed where I just wanted to disappear. 
And, I, and now I meet kids that are also going through issues in life, maybe not necessarily clothes or secondhand clothes or being poor. Um, I met this young man, Charlie, I don't know if I ever shared this story, but he, but he was an a, a all-state football player. He got scholarship to college, you know? And he was excited because he must be a pro football player, you know? And I said to him, you know, he's talking to me, he's a big guy, I couldn't believe how big this kid was. I mean, he's looking down at me, he's like, so you're a professional wrestler? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> so, but anyways, he's a great guy. I really like this kid. And I said to him, I said, man, your parents must be so proud of you. He goes, they never saw me play. And my heart just melted. I, one of the things that my, my parents, they, they, they didn't miss my sporting events. They, they, were, they were divorced, but they would, they would come to my sporting events. And it was a big deal you knowing your, your mom or your dad is at, a, is at a sporting event rooting you on because you know you can't do no wrong with them, you know. No. Um, but I just remember that feeling of, I felt like, I felt like just, hug, and I did hug the kid, you know, uh, he was very emotional. And um, I thought, wow, to go through life, the people you, you love that don't support you. And it made me feel like, wow, I wanted to be a, a support system for this kid or, or let him know that I'm so proud of him, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just so, just felt like he was my son almost, you know, that I knew how great of an athlete he was. And, and so Charlie, I, to, to, go back is and, and understand what you go through and, and what I feel I go through you know like there's just uh there's just so much pain in the world and I, I hate seeing other people go through pain and to really expand on my life I have to go through that pain on stage you know when my famous video that went viral about my mom you know every time I'm on stage I picture myself walking up to the casket and sometimes it brings tears to my eyes and, you know, there's a lot of emotion, but kids see it's real. You know, I'm not just saying the story. My mom died, my dad died, my brother died, my sister died. It's not just a story. These are emotional happenings that, that, that I, I experience and kids can relate to. But just like you, Charlie, I think that's what drives us, man, is, is, is helping someone that is going through pain or not wanting them have to go through yeah. something that you and I went through. And you, you had a good family. I mean, obviously uh, there was a time in your life that you felt lonely, you know, and I'm not sure. I don't know if you shared this. Is it not having a lot of friends? I mean, obviously you were in sports and sports was my, that was my Achilles heel, man. That was my thing because I had teammates that, that counted on me and I had people that, meant a lot that became friends and some of our friends for life now that I still, you know, keep in touch with. But what was, what, what was it that made you feel so lonely? You know, and I, 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 I think about this a lot and I'm also aware of kind of the stories you tell yourself, you know, you see the world and, and you see the world as this is the way it is. This is the way it was to me. What really made me start feeling that loneliness and isolation. It, I think it was when drugs and alcohol came into the scene. And I, I was only 12. I think we were only 12 the first time that, you know, drugs were at a party that we were at. And, you know, this is 20, well, I don't know, 27 years ago. So this is a long time ago. And I just remember at that time being like, wait a minute, what's going on? Why is this happening? And, and I knew, you know, well, this isn't right. We shouldn't be doing this. Why are we, why? I don't, I, I don't want to be here. I don't want to get in trouble. And then that's kind of what drove the feelings of isolation. Well, I'm, I'm not going to go like, and it's not like I speak delicately when I speak here, it's not a feeling of superiority. It's just, I don't, I don't want to be there because I have goals and I want to win a state title and I want to go to college. I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but with the law with my parents so it was all of those things that I just had this vision of going that way and a lot of stuff didn't fit into that and that's what created the isolation because there's there's especially in sports you know especially when you're you're, you're a top dog in sports the, the the that made it even more kind of isolating feeling and and maybe some of it was in my mind but I certainly felt man, I really feel alone right now. And, and that, you know, that I think is, is the root of it. And it's a feeling that you could, you can explain, you know, it's a feeling that you understand and it's a feeling that you can help someone else with because you understand what it's like to feel like that. You know, one of the things that I see with a lot of, you know, I guess counselors or psychologists that have never been through something that maybe you and I have been through or felt a certain way. Um, certainly not an advocate for drugs, but I had a real bad, 
a drug problem and being clean for what's uh, since 2003, so was it 17 years now? Um, I, I understand what it's like to, to go through that and I can talk to a kid that's having a problem with, with drugs or, or, or family or whatever the situation may be. But you know, Charlie, getting back to sports, I, I, I don't know if I ever shared this story with you, but when I first got into, my first sport I ever got into was hockey. And I was a really good street hockey player. I had good moves. I could dig people out. I was really fast too. I've always been really fast. And um, uh, so when I tried out for hockey, I couldn't skate. And so what kids that were, now remember this, this is at, at 12 years old. So I'm playing called Pee Wee Hockey and it was a team called Elwood. And so I'm, and the kids are coming by and hit the back of my skates where I would just fall right down out on the ice and it'd be really funny they'd laugh and and there was so you know there was a whole team and and I was like embarrassed because I couldn't skate so what they did was they you know every kid makes the team kind of thing you know what I mean I was the worst one I was like nobody would pick me so they stuck me in goalie I, I only could play goalie because a goalie doesn't really have to skate anywhere except in the in the crease of the, 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 the net and our first game they iced the puck and there's a shot it from one end to the other the other team Mm -hmm. And it was coming really slow, Charlie. Like you could almost blow on it. Like it looked like uh, uh, what's that game with the brooms? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, what is so the Olympic like, game. <laughs> curling, curling. Yeah, curling. <laughs> it looked like a curling <laughs> disc, right? And uh, so I go to take my stick and hit it back to one of my players, and I fanned on it, Charlie, and the puck just trickled into the net. Yeah. I. My father even said my father was watching, and he goes your white goalie mask actually turned red you know? <laughs> <laughs> because I was so embarrassed, you know, he made a joke of it. But Charlie here, let me, the, 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 the reason I'm sharing this story with you was we had 20 games that year after every practice. And even after games, I'd go home and my brother Joel would shoot pucks on me at me. We had, we had this uh, alleyway in our apartment and he would shoot pucks on me. And I'd practice being a goalie over and over. Charlie that year, I had 13 shutouts in 20 games. That year, at the banquet for the whole league, I was voted most valuable player. And I walked by all the guys that were hitting my skates when I couldn't skate, were laughing at me, were making fun of me. And I remember just getting that trophy. And I have, I, that's the only trophy I've ever kept, Charlie, mm -hmm. of all the trophies I've gotten from boxing or hockey or whatever sport I played. It's the only one I've ever kept and it's in my office. And I won the MVP for the 1972-1973 hockey season when I was 12 years old. And I remember that in, in the, because of going through that, man, I don't want to see kids hurt. I don't want to see kids being mocked or ridiculed or bullied or embarrassed. You know, it's an awkward age when you're in middle school. You know, your, your hormones are changing and you start getting pimples and, and, and kids love to pick on you. Your haircuts are weird and, you know, your body's shaped weird and everything's changing, you know. So I really, I don't know, I just gravitate to those kids. You know, when I post fighting and I got... I was actually figuring out what am I going to do with the rest of my life. And so I was a Spanish teacher for three years and then I was a professional fighter for almost eight years. And then it was like, okay, what am I going to do now? So I just already had made up my mind. I'm going to write a book. And that was my first book driven already knew that. Right. So then as I'm writing the book, I'm like, Oh wait, there's this thing called a professional speaker. What's that? Right. You know, I had heard the term motivational speaker before, inspirational speaker. I, I never knew what it was. I, I didn't understand it. I knew nothing about it. And then I was like, oh, OK, well, then I kind of learned that authors speak like that's kind of a tandem, like a lot of authors then speak on stages. And so I, I started talking and exploring and understanding the world of speaking, the world of kind of consulting, corporate uh, student educational base, all these different things. And a lot, a lot, lot, lot of the information early on was tangible, teachable system, right? So that was kind of what I was being taught, what I was being told. So whenever I would kind of come up with a talk or a pitch, you know, pitch my presentation to different people, I would always think of, all right, like tangible system. These are the five somethings that something, right? You know, like a, a way to do this, do it this way, you know, step by step by step. Because that's what I told 
was told that's the way you do it. And then I met you and I really understood all he's doing is telling a story. All he's doing is touching their hearts, right? Opening up an emotional connection to people. That's what I want to do. And I'm not saying that's like the only thing, you know, I'll, I read so much. I learned so much. I'm sure I'll have a different avenue or path. But when I get on stage to speak now directly because of you and because of talking to you behind the scenes, it's exactly my, my intent. You know, think of why you love movies. You know, like, why do I love Braveheart? Why do I love Gladiator? Why do I love those movies? Because they, they hit me in the heart and in the soul. Why is Rocky Balboa my, like, biggest hero ever in the world? Because of what he represents and the feeling, the emotion that I get when I watch it with him. And it's, it's like, blows me away. So how did you learn that, right? First of all, you know, steer me uh, straight if I'm off course at all. But how did you understand, like, the, 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 the because you have people literally that say, you saved my life. I was going to go home and commit suicide today. I had already written the letter. I didn't. And it's like, oh my gosh, what, what more better could you ever hear as a human being than you save someone's life? So again, correct me at all if I'm off. And then how did you understand and learn that, man, that's what it's about, opening up their heart and connecting with them? You know, Charlie, that is, you're, you're, you can't be more on than you are. Um, Jim Valvano, remember Jim Valvano, the North yep. Carolina basketball coach, had the famous speech at the ESPYs. And when I heard that speech, it really resonated with me because he said, if you could laugh, think, and cry in a day, you had a great day. You had a great day. And I thought, you know what? When I present, I want people to laugh. I want them to think about their, their future, their, their goals, their dreams, their aspirations. And I want them to cry, bring them to an emotion that may change their life forever, whether it's appreciating something that we often take advantage of. And, um, and that's why I really started thinking about how I wanted to present. But unfortunately, the, the tragedies that happened in my life were the perfect scenario for these discussions. So when I started sharing it, and just like anything, you know, becoming a, a fighter or whatever it is, uh, an inspirational speaker, you get better as you, as you practice more and more, as you do more and more, as you have more fights, you get better at it, you know? And I started speaking and, and then I, I realized, wow, these people, I can't believe how many people are crying, you know, like the emotion that it's, it's driving through the, the audience is absolutely incredible. And because I would share my whole story, I would share uh, the death of, of my mother, my father, my brother, my sister. And I realized it's way too much. <laughs> it's like when I got the part about my dad dying, you'd hear a gasp in the audience. They'd go, oh, like they, it was almost like you're, overdoing it you know yeah. and i actually toned it down and, and i took my father out of it because that was one of the most powerful ones of him dying in my arms but i, I gotta tell you when you when you bring emotion into the audience people first of all can relate to you and and that's something uh, charlie that i i it fits perfect for what i want to talk about about something i i realized about you is that you, you say you wear your heart on your sleeve. And when I read that, I'm going, oh, gosh, that's, that's me. Man. You know? And we do. We wear our heart on our sleeve because we can share from our heart about situations or feelings or things we've gone through in our life. You know? But it's so funny. I mean, um, reading, reading your, your book, um, World's Toughest Lifelong Learner, there's, there's a certain aspect about you that's kind of funny. Like, you almost share like too much. <laughs> I go, oh, Charlie, why are you tell people that? You know, because in, in a sense, as macho men, we think something makes us look weak. But as I'm reading your book, I'm going, damn, that's what I do, you know? And and and, and it's so cool to see someone else do it. But I'm I'm almost like feel like I'm protecting you. I'm going, oh no, it's too much, Charlie. And I'm going, no, it's 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 perfect, man. So it was kind of funny reading the stuff that I, I, I the, the, the parts of about your book that I already knew about you, but it's, yeah. you're just so honest. And I love that, man, because man, I, I tell you, it's, uh, I'd rather be slapped by the truth than, than, than lied to, man, you know, and, and it's nice to be around someone that you can count on or, or can believe in. And especially when you read things that are very similar to things that I feel or I'm going through, 
um, there, there's no better freedom than honesty. There is. And uh, I commend you about that. And, um, you know, anyone that has not gotten your book, man, the world's toughest lifelong learner, it's a really good read. And it really reveals a lot of things about yourself when you read this book, you know, even things you, you're, you share in this book, but it's very informative and I, I'm really enjoying it. And like I said, I'm halfway through. And uh, so another one of my, I'm, 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 the reason why it's taking me a little while is I'm reading a, another book from Jensen Franklin. I actually met him in person and he gave yeah. me the book. It was like, you got to read this. I saw you, yeah, I hard. saw you make that post. You were going to read them both. And I was like, Oh, yeah. you might not more than he can chew. You know what's so hard is that I meet so many people. I just met a guy the other day, he gave, he gave me this book called Fraud, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they sign him to me. And it's like, it's like, they, they feel like, he's going to read it today, you know? Yeah. And it's like, the, the embarrassing thing is I meet so many people that write books and they always give me their book or sign over to me and let me know how you like it, you know? And then like two months, three months later, you, you, they, they text you, Hey, how did you like my book? I go, Oh my God, I haven't started it yet. You know, and, but, uh, but I, you know, I knew I would enjoy your book and, and, and I will, I'm going to have that one done very soon. Well, I, appreciate I, I think you I commend you for, for, for the honesty that you bring. And I think that's why you're becoming such an amazing speaker is you bring that honesty to the stage. And if more presenters did that, they'd be much more successful. You know, I appreciate that. And I, I don't, there's, you know, different levels of compliments and that's, you know, one of the highest level of compliments. And, and I don't know why I am that way. I think it comes from my desire to help, to, to not feel Lone, help others not feel lonely. I tell the story somewhat often, but I remember when I was a kid and I would walk past the help wanted signs. I might actually write about in the book, help wanted in different restaurants and everything. And I thought that meant like help wanted, like we need money. Can you give us money because we need help or we're going to have to close the doors. I didn't understand that it was, they were looking for workers. And if you're looking for work, go in there. And I just remember feeling like I wanted to help them. And so that probably coupled with my upbringing, but you know, you, you told me that off air about like met, uh, measuring my vulnerability and the things that I'm sharing. It's like kind of being too honest. You know, it's like being too honest. So like <laughs> it, you meet someone and, and you, you, you maybe you get along great, right? And everything's great. And you might say, you know, like, uh, boy, I used to think you were a total jerk. And it's like, why, why did you say that? You didn't, it's like, you didn't have to say that. You could just not say it. I remember one story I had, and this kind of goes with that knee jerk reaction to, I don't know if the words overcompensate or give too much or whatever. Um, and I write about my first book, but I remember I sold, you know, I sell shirts and part of me like feels bad for taking people's money. I don't know why it's just a weird thing I have in my mind. So I was selling the shirts for $20. They gave me a $20 bill and I just felt uncomfortable taking their money. So I was like, here, have $5 back. And I gave them the, the shirt cost, <laughs> the shirt cost $20 and I gave it to them for 50 for no reason. There was no deal. There was no nothing. I was just nervous and I gave it right back to them. Oh, that's so funny. You know, so uh, I, to, to talk about something like that the other day, uh, I was wearing a, a, a Think Paws hat. I never wear hats, you know, but I was going, I had to go to the grocery store or something and I, my hair was going every which way but loose, you know, and uh, so I just threw this, this cap on, right? And someone wrote to me, a, a person that, that's a friend of mine on, on social media wrote to me, um, man, I really like your hat. Where can I get one of those hats? And I, we sell those hats, you know, but it was like, uh, you know what? I just, you know, instead of having, like we have a whole system that, that Wendy sends out merchandise, you know? And so I just figured, ah, let me just do this, you know? So take it to the post office. It cost me eight bucks to send it. I know. <laughs> you know not only that, that charger cost me eight bucks. <laughs> I sent out. So but you know what? It made me so happy to know that she's going to really enjoy that hat. And this is not for anybody that's going to ask me for stuff now, okay? Yeah. It's <laughs> funny, man. With some my... things that some people just hit you a certain way that you just want to, you just want to make their, yeah. make them. So in my book, you know, I reference a lot of people I had on the show. And so I sent, you know, copies of the books, I think to most everybody in the book that I would quote or reference, I'd send them a copy of the book and say, thank you. You know, can I use your words and then kind of sending it to say thank you. And uh, I remember there were a couple international ones and it, you know, it's like X dollars to print the book and then to package it and send it is like, you know, I spent close to, I don't know, probably 800 bucks sending those books out and total. And then, uh, 
there were like two or three international ones. And I, it literally cost me, I want to say like 40 bucks to send a book to another country. I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to limit my international quotes because it's getting expensive. <laughs> it's so funny, Charlie, when you're saying this is that, because I think about the book you send me, okay? It's, it's so funny that I have it. I have it right here. This is so, this is so funny. Not only did you send me my book that you wrote, but you sent me um, every page that I'm on. <laughs> Let me tell you how much this meant to me. And that was handwritten too. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but no, but the funny thing was, that it's like, Mark, you are right. I reference you on page 21, 113, 133, 177, 186. <laughs> Talk about. Thank you for everything. Enjoy the read and please tag me if you post. Spaniard. Yeah. Look at so I think about you doing that for me. Yeah. So you know other people who send the book to you. <laughs> same thing, okay? So the effort you put into this, sending out this book means so much. And that's why I, I actually saved this and, and it just meant a lot to me. You know, it's so funny that you said that. Yeah, you know what? Uh, sometimes it's hard to make money when you give it all away all the yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And I, I'm glad you appreciate that. And, you know, we made a conscious decision when we printed the book. You're like, one, are we going to ask for permission? Because that's like a gray line. Should we? Shouldn't we? And we thought, okay, it's best to. So we reached out. And that's like, I think there were about 50, uh, 60 maybe going back and forth. And then it was like, okay, well, how do I do this? Do I type up a letter, like, and just print it out, write their name? And then it was like, no, you know, a success principle is going the extra mile. You know, John Wooden talks about going the extra mile, always do your best. Um, and we thought, you know what? No, the, 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 the going the extra mile is doing this. And that's, you talk about my parents and that's how I was raised. We're going to do it. Does it suck? Yeah, a lot. Very much so. And I think it was over Christmas break. I was at my, uh, we were staying at my brother's house over Christmas break and I would just get up in the dark and I would handwrite those letters and handwrite those, um, envelopes and send them out. And, you know, knowing that it landed in your hands and in your appreciation, honest to goodness, it like <laughs> worth it. That was worth it. So I'm glad it, it, it you know, like it's funny Charlie, as, as we get older, I am the absolute worst writer. I mean, I, I, it's like, I lost my, my mojo yep. on writing, you know, cause we, you know, you're always typing and printing, but as we, it's like, I couldn't even, I couldn't think of writing a, 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 a handwritten letter, you know, like I have to print now, yep. you know, my writing is so bad. So it's, uh, it just, it was just nice to see that. And, and uh, <laughs> see my, my name in your book was really cool. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and I want to also send a special, I know Dred, my partner will be listening to this, but you know, he, he helped me organize and kind of figure out what system we were going to take to do all that. And he has so many systems in place to help me locate what page numbers they're on. And we correspond via Google drive and back and forth. So, you know, a, a big thank you to dread for that as well. Um, good, good, man. good, good friend that, that works with you, man. It's always good to have that. Um, you know, it's a, uh, that's a, you know, I travel with, who, who do you travel? Do you, don't you travel with? No, you, you just me for now. I, yeah. I, I look See, forward I, I, to I have the a day. Travel, travel partner that runs my presentation, uh, Manny. And uh, not, he's not only just a travel partner, he's like one of my closest friends in the world. And, and he, is, he is a really funny guy. Like he's, he's the most even killed person I've ever met in my life. Like, like no matter what happens, he never gets upset, never swears. He's, he's just calm all the time, you know, but he's got the most amazing sense of humor and he gets me laughing so hard because we meet so many people that are going through such tragedies that you, you know, you could get in the car and drive two hours to the next town and be, oh my gosh, that was, oh, I feel so bad for that person or whatever, you know. But you, you can't, you, you have to lighten things up. And he is one guy that can take my, my, my mood, so to speak, and mm -hmm. just say something that's really funny about something that happened or someone, somewhere we went or, or something. And it's good to have that because laughter is so important. And Charlie, I probably realize this more now than ever, how important it is to get a funny post or, or, or someone send you a funny meme or something that makes you laugh because, you know, Obviously, many of us kind of home quarantine now. Um, it's 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 tough, you know. When I say quarantine, I mean that yeah. no one's really going anywhere anymore. You know, most of the and, stores are closed down and stuff. You know, I think there's a lesson in there also for everyone, especially young people. 
what a person he is to be around, right? Someone who makes you smile, someone who makes yeah. you laugh, someone who's positive. You know, reading all these books, I pick up on things. And one of the things that I picked up on is the value of uh, charisma and energy and being positive. Yes. See, people, want, people want to be around those things. So if you're a young person looking to make your mark, be positive, be it not, not fake, right? Just, just yeah, no. believe in you know, it. You, could, you know, it's a choice. It really is. Like I, I could wake up every day and go, Oh my gosh, we're, we're not making any money. This will be a terrible day. I have nothing to do. I, or I could just say, you know what? I'm going to make a, have a great day today. Yeah. I choose to be happy. Happiness for me is it's a choice. It doesn't mean bad things don't happen to you. It's, it's, it's not so much about the circumstance or situation. It's how we respond to it. That makes all the difference. Yeah. And we have a choice on how to respond. You know, I don't like to use foul language. I don't choose to be around people that, that use a lot of foul language. Um, the funny thing is that, well, one of my best friends in the world swears all the time. Okay, I just got to share this with you because you know who he is. Diamond Dale's page is one of my closest friends. I love him. He's one of the most positive guys you're ever going to meet in your life. But he has a mouth on him, man. Every other word is the F-bomb. <laughs> vocabulary so it's when you when you grew up in the you know when you're in the wrestling industry that's just the locker room everything is f this f that you know but ddp takes it to another level and he's, he's actually kind of funny because of it but when he comes over to my house i always say to him oh, ad you know please don't drop the f <laughs> <laughs> just be careful, you know, and, and he always respects that, you know, and he's really good. But every once in a while, it, it just comes out. It just, it's just part of his vocabulary and, and we'll get laughing and stuff. But uh, um, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff that he's doing, man. He's just I, taking yeah. uh, uh, positive, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, Positively Motivation meets oh, inspiration. Okay. Yeah. Ins was that, was it motivation meets, oh no, inspiration meets a uh, perspiration yeah. for his, yeah. uh, his DDPY and he's just taking his whole thing to another level. And I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud to call him a friend also. And he is who connected us. So that, that's another neat yes, kind of connection there. Yeah. And I, it, it's now, extra. Did you meet him first? You met, yeah. Did you so meet him first? yeah, he was on a, a friend of mine's podcast and I reached out to him because of, so again, he's famous, like you're famous. So people, who knows if they're going to respond because people are very busy. Um, but a guy I was training, Dave, who had lost over a hundred pounds, DDP was his idol. And, mm. uh, I was like, huh? And I saw DDP on my friend's podcast and I reached out to my buddy, Jim. And I was like, Hey, do you communicate with him? Like, is there any way you could put me in contact with him? So I reached out to DDP, explained to him because DDP, why helping people, you know? So I explained my, my, my buddy and, and the work that we've done and his commitment to getting healthy. And, um, you know, I, I think I asked for like maybe a, a shout out on Facebook or something and he went above and beyond yeah, and then it, like it, it invited us to yeah. his brother's house in New Jersey and we spent the <laughs> afternoon with him. It was yeah. like, wow, this is awesome. Yes. That guy, he spends more time calling people that like have been successful in this program that they're like, Oh my God, I can't believe this yeah. guy's yeah, yeah. you know, that's how he is. Hey, I wanted to hold this up. You'll appreciate it. It's pretty timely. So as I was talking about dread, one of the things we're doing during this time of self-quarantine, people being at home is we're releasing two interviews per week because I have a lot more time to re record interviews. And uh, he said, well, you know what, what would help is if you could let your guests know ahead of time to just not swear. That way he wouldn't have to edit it out. So yeah. you are my first interview. Do you see what that says? <laughs> please don't swear. <laughs> so I created a post it and I put it on my desk to ask people, please don't swear. And Mark, obviously I didn't have to say, cause I knew you weren't going to no, swear. I, but <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Please don't swear. That's, that's really funny. Oh, um, man. We, we have probably about 15 minutes left, but I want to talk about two different things. One, maybe for 10 minutes, the other one for five you have a team that works with you. And, and I think a lot of people, everyone's life has been affected by COVID and, and everything that's going on and being at home, students being out of school, people being out of work, a lot of people not getting paid at all. Right. And I work for myself. My wife has a job. She's a teacher. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'll be okay. A lot of people aren't going to be okay. 
Um, a lot of people have people that depend on them. A lot of people provide for whatever. You have people working for you. And I, I only bring this up because I think it helps people to understand that Mark Merrow has troubles too, you know, and Mark Merrow is figuring this out as well. So maybe speak to that a little bit and how you're handling that. Well, it is one of the toughest things we've ever been through. I mean, we, we depend on live presentations to pay our staff. And, um, you know, the rest of the school year has been pretty much canceled. So we have no, no, no revenue coming in, some, some small donors, but it's not obviously enough to pay our bills and sustain a staff. So we're going to have to lay people off. And unfortunately, I, I, I encourage them to collect unemployment or do whatever they, they have to do, but there's just no way we could sustain a company in this, in this troubled time. Um, you know, gosh, it's, it's one of the hardest things that you, we all have to go through, um, especially when you depend on income. You know, we, we all have bills. We all have things we have to take care of, families and things like that. So it's, it's very hard. And seeing what other people are going through, I mean, you know, Charlie, I think what, what has really helped me is that no matter how bad I have, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what my staff is going through, there are people that are in a hospital with a ventilator on wonder if they're even going to be alive tomorrow. So whenever you think how bad you have, know that there's always someone out there that has it a lot worse. And we're going to get through this. You know, most of us are going to be okay. We're going to get through this. The economy will eventually come back and hopefully next year we'll be back on stages at schools all over the country, all over the world and, and, and look back on this and say, what do we do with that idle time? What do we, what do we, what, what helped us in life during this time that we always said, man, I wish I had time to do this or do that. And, and that's one thing I talked about last night. I mean, there's people out there, there's so much, uh, so much talent out there. My gosh, some of you don't even realize how talented you are. Maybe you can write a book, a novel, a, a screenplay. You know, you're, you're gifted. Your voice is a, a magical, man. You're like an angel when you sing. Get a YouTube channel. Do something. You know, make, make use this time wisely. Some of us will never have this much time on our hands. Instead of just getting in front of TV with a clicker and going through TV shows or binge watching Netflix or, or, or whatever, um, Use your time. Think about what you want to do in your life. Where do you see yourself a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Can you look back on your life and said, it was during that time I had off that I decided what I want to do with my life or I wanted to pursue things. You know, Charlie, every successful person has, led, uh, has left a trail of success. You could Google someone's name and see what college they went to, uh, where they studied, how they got into. They have success. One thing about a lot of successful people, they love to talk about themselves. <laughs> okay, so you'll see interviews on how they got somewhere, what school they went to, who they met, where, who their manager is, whatever, whatever it is. Google things, you know. People will say, um, I want to be a WWE wrestler. Okay, well, Google wrestling school near me. Start somewhere, you know. They, it's almost like people think that the uh, – the, the sweepstakes companies would come and knock on the door with a bunch of balloons and a hundred thousand dollars and said, Hey, go ahead and, and enjoy your life. It don't happen like that, man. Work ethic, man. Go after your dreams and goals. Start searching. We have this internet in front of us that you can find anything. You want to know all about me to Google my name, Mark Merrill. I was a character called Johnny B. Bad. In fact, I was so pretty. I should be born a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> So my, I, anyways, but that's uh, that's what I want to say about that. Use this time, man. But uh, it is unfortunate that many of us are going through some really hard times and really unfortunate uh, situations, and especially financially. We don't know how long this is going to last, but let's make the best of it. Yeah, and Mark, you know, I, I, I was going to share this earlier, and and I'll share it now because you mentioned you know, being aware of what you do have or the potential that other people have it, you know, worse or on a respirator. And that, that reminded me, and I don't know if I've told, talked to you off air about it or not, but back in September, and so there's two parts of the story. Back in September, uh, unbeknownst, this was all going on kind of simultaneously and us not knowing it. So early September, mid-September, what turned out, my brother uh, developed a tumor and has brain cancer. And my mom, um, towards the middle of September, started feeling numbness and weakness in her fingers. Turns out she was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, disease called myasthenia gravis. And it totally, so my mom was in ICU. We thought she was dying. Like it was, it was 
uh, terrorizing her body and she was incapacitated. She was on a, a ventilator and uh, feeding tube for 21 days. She was in the ICU. Wow. And uh, we, we, we were, my brother at that time was at, U, they were in different UPMC hospitals. So my family and I were in this, like as much as any time in my life, this made me appreciate my family because there was no question we were going to be with them. So the six of us took time off work, time away from home. My brother, my, all of us have small kids. Um, you know, so we had to figure out everyone worked together, but there was no question that we were going to not let that person be alone. Yeah. And my, uh, you know, my mom has come back. She's probably about 85%. My brother had uh, the tumor removed and, and was on treatment and, and got a good, you know, w w prayers that it continues going well, but he got a, a clear um, MRI. So for now, we're good. But amidst all of this, and, you know, my, my troubles are relatively small, you know, because it's like my brother is healthy. My mom is healthy. That's it. Like gigs are being canceled, but you know what, I can give my mom a call. Um, and I can give my brother a call. And I don't know how it's going to work out in the future. But that's how it's working out now. And I want to second part of that, I want to tell you, I shared that on stage for the first time, you know, this all happened in September. And I asked my my mom and my brother, hey, what would you think if I shared this story and these pictures on stage? And th their question was, what, 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 for what, like, what's, what do you want to do? Um, and it was just to, to you share your mom's story, you share your family story. And I saw, I see what that does for people, how that helps people. And that was exactly why I wanted to do it. And it's amazing. The kids who come up to me and even the staff who comes up to me afterwards and, and comments on that because it, it, it's, it helps a lot to know hey, other people are going through stuff too. And that's directly because of you that, that I share those stories on stage. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Charlie. That's beautiful. I'm, I'm so glad you're, they're doing better. But, uh, you know, we, we often take granted the very things in life we, we should appreciate. And you, you appreciating your mom and, and sharing that story, I, I'm sure it, it, many people that heard that went home and told their parents that they loved them and, and um, how much they meant to them because there's no promises of tomorrow, you know, but we have today. <laughs> today is a day that we can rejoice in and, and be glad that we have today. Um, I, I, I pray that your, your family has full recovery. You know, it's, uh, you, you, you don't know. I, I never knew what life would be like without my mom until she was gone. And I, I gotta tell you, Charlie, it's, it's so weird. There's times where you just like pick up the phone and calling her and, or, or, you know, my dad or my brother or my sister and people that are, we will never see again or, or until there's a reunion in heaven, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, it's, uh, I hope people that are hearing this will, will reach out to a loved one and let them know, let them know how much you care, how much you love them. It's so important. Now, the, uh, the last thing, and, and we'll wrap it up here. Last thing. So I'm a fanboy of wrestling, of you, of DDP, as much as I am acquaintances and friends of you guys. And, you know, my brothers and I actually, my wife, <laughs> it was so awesome for my birthday. She bought us tickets to, um, was it Smack? Oh, it was uh, WWE Live, right? So this, this road to WrestleMania at the Bryce Jordan Center. So my brothers and I went and we were talking about all, all, all kinds of wrestling history. Of course, I was bragging, oh, look who's in my phone, Mark Merrill and DDP are in my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but so as a fan, I'm, I'm asking this question. <clears throat> what's, what's one of your uh, one or two favorite memories from your career? Um, I mean, obviously, the first time you win a major championship belt, you know, um, it was uh, it was actually on my mother's birthday, you know, and, and, and she was still alive. Um, so that was kind of cool. And, you know, being Johnny be bad, she was mama be bad. You know? So I dedicated <laughs> the match to her after I won. <laughs> um, that, and then just some of the I, some of the great match I had with with Stone Cold Steve Austin um brian pillman fall brawl was incredible 30 minutes we went and it was just non-stop 
And of course, DDP was like being in a regular fight, okay? It's, we just killed each other. I don't know what it was, but there was more potato. Potato was when you accidentally hit the guy a little too hard. Uh -huh. There was more potatoes in those matches and more receipts. Yeah, I got uh, to tell There were some of my favorite, favorite memories in, in the business. I got to tell you, man, I, I, I love when you post your clips on social media, your, your old clips, both wrestling and boxing. Man, I'm, because you're such a calm, yeah. quiet, helpful guy. And then I'm watching, especially the boxing, because I'm like, oh, my God, like, he's legit. Like, this guy is, is bad, right? This is, this is he's, he's, he's bad, man. Like, this is a tough dude. And then I'm seeing you wrestling. All, but, I mean, you're still in extremely good shape. But, like, it, it's odd to me that this guy that I call who's so calming and helpful and et cetera. And people say it to me too with fighting, but man, when I look, it, it blows my mind. So listeners, you know, look at Mark, you know, listen to Mark now. Uh, and don't forget where he came from, man. Cause it's, it's freaking awesome. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, Spaniard. I appreciate that so much, man. Um, sports was a, an escape, you know, for, for both of us. It was a, it was an escape, uh, something we love to do. And we could, we could kind of direct our, you know, our, our energy into something so positive, you know, what, what, what other sports did you do besides wrestling? Uh, I was pretty big in ba football, baseball, and wrestling. And then I did some okay. running as well. So, so basically three or three, four sports. Yeah. Cause I was, uh, uh, in high school it was, uh, it was, a uh, football, uh, boxing, uh, hockey. And then I even played a, a year of lacrosse too. So yeah. I, and then, of course, didn't get into wrestling until I was 30 years old, professional wrestling. Yeah. And uh, signed my first contract at 31 with WCW after just going to school for a few months. So I was very, very blessed to get in so quickly. Well, I appreciate you being here, Mark. Um, you know, you're a continued inspiration and friend to me. You're, you're one of the uh, not just favorite people I've met post fighting or famous people i've met but just favorite humans i think what you do is oh, you. tremendous the the amount of lives that you positively influence and affect my life that, that you influence and in, in affect and i'm grateful for our friendship and our relationship and your mentorship that's another big part because you could very easily say huh this guy's trying to do what i do i'm not going to share the secrets but you, you've, <laughs> you've shared everything with me and, and i'm you're going to do it better than i did okay? uh, I don't know if that's possible. It was great to see, you know, it's, it's so cool to see friends become successful. You know, that's, that's such a joy you have, you know, seeing friends from the wrestling is because we see so many tragedies, tragedies out of the professional wrestling industry of guys that lost everything and, and, and have gone through some really hard times and died so young. But then when you see the success stories that have came out from someone that could reinvent their life and yeah. doing something different is, is beautiful. And so, I love helping people. I just, you know, I, gosh, I, there's going to be a day where, man, you're going to be like a Tony Robbins and having all these giant auditoriums and stuff. And, and I might even get a backstage pass. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get more than a backstage pass. First of all, thank you. Um, but uh, share, you know, before sending off, share your social media. Uh, and I, I hope you do more live streams. I didn't catch the last thing you did last night or the night before. Um, but share your information, social media, website, et cetera. Yeah, you know, we almost got 100,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. That's really taken off. So it's, and that's The Mark Marrow. And um, uh, Facebook, you could find me, just type in my name. Mark is with a C, M-A-R-C-M-E-R-O. And YouTube, Instagram, all those. I'm on, on, I'm on all of them. So just check them out. And, and, um, and I, I often respond to someone that writes to me. And so um, check it out, man. And uh Spaniard, I hope to see you soon, buddy. It's been a long time that we've actually been together, but yeah. uh, hopefully we'll, our paths will cross soon. We'll get through this, man, this, this coronavirus. We're going to get through this. Uh, they're they're going to find a, whether it's finding a cure or, or you know, it's, it, 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 it could go as quick as it came and, and yeah. we'd be okay, you know? So hang in there. Thanks, brother. All right, brother. God bless you. All right, so I'll stop recording there. Uh